Well, folks, I am sad to say that we're about a week late, but we've been summoned to solve the case of the missing marks. What did my kid do wrong, Rainbow Ape asks, and you can see surprisingly this post is resolved, so we are going to get a definitive answer. What won't be definitive is people's takes on the teacher's grading. The student has provided the correct answer to a question, concluding that 511 is a term of a particular sequence, and they have received no marks. And not only was their answer correct, but so too was their reasoning. So let's take a look at this problem and see if we can determine what the kid did wrong. The OP's eldest child is in year 8 and brought this core mathematics paper home. Let's take a look. The rule for the nth term of a sequence is 5n plus 16. This means we can find terms of the sequence by plugging positive integers into the given expression. For example, the first term can be found by plugging in n equals 1. 5 times 1 plus 16 is is 21, so that's the first term of the sequence. Accordingly, we could also plug in 10 to solve this first problem, find the 10th term of the sequence, and we can see the student do that, plugging in 10 for n and doing the multiplication and adding 16. Had to sneak in that zero next to the plus sign, but it works out, they got the correct answer, and of course, received credit. But then the controversial part, this next problem. By forming and solving an equation, decide whether 511 is a term of this sequence. We know that 66 is the first term, but if we keep going, does 511 eventually come around? Let's solve this problem ourselves, and then we'll compare to the student's solution. We can describe the sequence itself by writing an equation. We could write that a n is equal to 5 times n plus 16. This means to find that nth term of the sequence, just plug n into this. And this is actually an example of what's called an arithmetic sequence. That's because the terms of this sequence have a common difference. We know the first term, when n equals 1, is 21, but every time n goes up, thus moving forward in the sequence, the terms increase by 5. That's the common difference. So the terms keep going up by 5, and our question is, does 511 eventually occur? To answer that, we can set up an equation. We know that the terms of our sequence take the form 5n plus 16. So will this form ever give us a value of 511? We'll have to solve the equation to answer that. Most people would do so using the onion method. You build the onion up and then you peel it away, but I'm going to use some different tactics. I'm going to solve this equation by just doing the algebra, so we'll start by subtracting 16 from both sides. Thus, 5n equals 495. To finish solving for n, we simply divide both sides of the equation by 5. Thus, we arrive at n equals 99. Now, a lot of students who skip over instructions might be tempted to stop here. Oh, that's what n is. We found the missing value. It's 99. But of course, finding n was not our question. Our question didn't even mention n. It just said, by forming and solving an equation, decide whether 511 is a term of the sequence. So what's our conclusion from this? Well, this means that if we plug n equals 99 into the expression that defines the sequence, we'll find that the 99th term is in fact 511. And we can see that the student took very, very similar steps, 511 minus a 16, and then they did 495 divided by five, just like we did to arrive at 99. It's worth pointing out that the actual important thing here is that the value for n, 99, is a natural number. It's a positive integer. That's what these wacky symbols mean. 99 is an element of the natural numbers. It's a positive integer. And that's how sequence sequences work. They have first terms, second terms, third terms, and so on. They don't have pith terms and 2.7th terms. It has to be a positive integer we plug in to get 511, otherwise 511 couldn't possibly be a term of the sequence. In contrast, if we were asked to find if 512 is a term of the sequence, we'd set it up the same exact way and we would solve for n. Then when we divide both sides by 5, we wouldn't get 99, a positive integer, but in fact 99.2. 
We'd then notice this isn't a positive integer, which means that 512 isn't a term of the sequence. So then how on earth in this question worth three marks did the student not earn a single one? They did the work, found that n equals 99, and concluded correctly that 511 is a term of the sequence. They even went a step further and checked their work by plugging 99 in to the expression, you see this, 5 times 99, and finding that yes indeed you get 511. Correct answer, correct reasoning, checked work, zero points. Obviously when you put it that way, it sounds pretty bad for the teacher, but we must draw our attention, of course, to the instructions. The instructions said that we were supposed to form and solve an equation. And remember, that's what we did. We formed an equation and we solved for n. Of course, the student didn't use n, and in fact, they didn't really form an equation either. Instead, what they formed here was a little bit of hogwash. 511 minus 16 is equal to 495, but it's not equal to 495 divided by five because 495 divided by five is equal to 99. This is a fairly common abuse of the equal sign among younger math students. And this issue with the equal sign can be exacerbated by calculator use since this is basically how you would communicate with a simple four function calculator, but it's not how to communicate the mathematics to a human reader. In basic calculators, if you type 511 minus 16 equals, then you're just gonna have 495 on your display and you're free to continue performing operations on that. The calculator takes commands, but the teacher is reading this work. The student clearly knows what they're doing, even though they've communicated the steps a bit recklessly. I mean, the fact that they checked their work tells you they know for sure what they're doing here. So should they have earned not a single mark? Well, let's look at some of the opinions on this. And as always, I think some of the arguments may surprise you. This fella diagnosed the problem immediately, quoting the instructions, which said by forming and solving an equation, the student was expected to write 5n plus 16 equals 511 and to solve for n. So the student lost all the points, not because their conclusion was incorrect, of course, but because they did not follow the instructions in how they were supposed to set up and solve the problem. Of course, they also point out the issue with the equal sign. And really, if the student didn't play so fast and loose with the equal sign, they probably would have solved it the way the teacher wanted. Another person agrees, but then we start to get a little bit of that pile on on the teacher. Yeah, so much about math is effective communication, and a lot of people, not just students, but adults as well, don't get this. Totally agree. But then in this light, the X from the teacher with no information is really ineffective communication. It's a lazy assessment, given that the thinking is mostly evident, which is true. There should be part marks. What do you guys think? Is this ineffective communication from the teacher? The photo's a bit zoomed in, so if we assume that they didn't write anything else on this problem, then maybe it's a little little bit lazy to just write the X. The teacher could put the X to indicate no credit, but then put some check marks to indicate work that's actually valid and perhaps circle the key part of the instructions which have not been followed. But we also have to understand a teacher is potentially going to grade dozens of copies of this work and it may be better for everybody if instead of writing extensive commentary on every problem, they diagnose the problems that the class has as a whole and cover them in class with everybody. Fizz Assist said, the abuse of the equal sign is frustrating. To remedy that, I use an arrow. Somebody please tell me that's okay. And yeah, an arrow is a common fix to this equals abuse problem. So if the student really wanted to write their work horizontally, they could have written 511 minus 16 equals 495. Then instead of performing an operation on something that's already part of an equation, write an arrow to say next, 495 divided by 5 equals 99. But the classic solution is to, instead of just writing out a sequence of calculations, begin by forming the equation that is actually the basis for your reasoning. And then we typically stack our steps vertically. Torak McLaren describes a professor he had who pretty much insisted that your math solutions were written in prose. 
And of course, us math people love that. That's how math papers are written. It's how proofs are written once you get out of geometry class. We don't write it in two columns. It's just prose. It's reasoning. It's the most natural form of written communication. I quickly wrote what a complete solution to our problem today in prose might look like. But even after writing this, I have a, a little qualm with it that... I won't bother going into detail about. Of course, you're not typically gonna be expected to write your math homework in prose like this. But if you're a student struggling with the idea of always having to show your work, think of it like this. Your teacher wants you to be successful. They want to give you as many points as they possibly can. And you're gonna help them out a lot in giving you all the points you deserve by writing your work clearly and completely. Now, of course, you might think my teacher's not like that and that sucks. But certainly in general, your teacher's gonna have an an easier time rewarding you more partial credit if your work is clear and easy to understand. Speaking of clear and easy to understand, this one cracked me up. This fella criticizes teachers feeling smug and superior for writing problems that most students won't understand in the way they intend. And he does this while writing some of the most over-the-top, flowery prose I have ever seen on Reddit. Nothing says clear and direct communication like a comma separated frankly. I can't help but wonder how frank the rest of this prose is. I can't lie, I like flowery prose, but uh, I don't know, I got a kick out of this. This fella totally disagrees with the student earning no marks. He says, this is such a take though. Math as a language doesn't matter until you're well into undergrad, perhaps graduate studies or the workforce. Plain and simple, your kid's teacher is a thoughtless twage. You should try to fight them on this. If they don't budge, get the principal involved. I understand why someone would have this take, but I totally disagree. There's nothing wrong with being a harsh grader to get your students to communicate as clearly as you know they're capable of and to help them build good habits for the future. Now, was this grading too harsh? I think probably. This seems like the type of thing where as a teacher going through and grading the same paper over and over again, you might just check, do I find the equation that I know I asked for in the instructions? If I don't see that equation, you're not getting any credit. In addition, it would be fair to say you shouldn't earn any points for just a correct conclusion because someone else could have this correct conclusion and none of the supporting work. And surely you shouldn't earn a point for just happening to guess correctly. Since this student did have supporting reasoning, it might be that if they went and pled their case, the teacher would say, oh yeah, you're right, you totally understood this, let me give you a point or two for your process, even if it was a little bit messy. The issue for a teacher, though, is if you're going through and grading problems like this so quickly, I don't see the equation, so I don't give any credit, even if you are open to giving credit when there actually is a good reason to receive some and a student comes and pleads their case, there will be a lot of students over the course of time who didn't earn any points, even though they might have deserved some, and and are just never going to go plead their case. So as a teacher, you assume to a reasonable degree a burden of trying to understand the student's work. But of course, as a student, you want to help your teacher understand your work by writing clearly so that you don't get gypped out of points you deserve. This guy said, kid did it right in his brain, but wrote it down wrong. And then a reply, I'd say more like the kid might have done it right in his brain because it is just as likely the kid just wrote down some random operations that turned out to have been the lucky pick he needed. This is crazy. Just as likely? Does this guy know how many numbers there are? I can think of like at least a dozen numbers. So just lucking into relevant calculations here doesn't seem very likely. So what do you guys think of this question and the grading? Did the student get the right answer? Yes. Was their reasoning valid? Yes. Did they deserve full points? No. Did they deserve any points? I think, yeah, I think they deserve points, especially because they checked their answer. This is such a case of great work, but bad form. One last note in looking at this work from a non-American, this person said, it's always weird to see how Americans write one, four, and seven. Is it weird to see how Americans write one, four, and seven? I don't know, let me try, you guys tell me. Tuck the table of Texas instruments don't reply. Well, I think this time it might be fatal. Wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm traded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull a brain and push it all the way through the whole blue planet. Faded.